Would you please stand as we continue with the responsive song? Fools say to themselves, God doesn't matter. They are all corrupt. They have done terrible things. There is no one who does what is right. The Lord looks down at men from heaven to see if there are any who are wise, any who worship him. But they're all gone. They are all equally bad. Not one of them does what is right, not a single one. Don't they know, asks the Lord, are all these evildoers ignorant? They live by robbing my people and do not pray to me. But they will become terrified because God is with those who obey him. They make fun of the plans of the helpless man because he trusts in the Lord. How I pray that salvation will come to Israel from Zion when the Lord makes his people prosperous again. Jacob's descendants will be happy. The people of Israel will be glad. Our gospel reading for this evening is from Luke chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him, that's Jesus, off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice, they cried out, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant them their demand. Here ends our gospel reading. Please be seated as we join in the theme verse.
The good that I would, I do not, St. Paul once wrote, and the evil I would not, that I do. And that's in Romans 7, 19. What the apostle was describing is a common problem, one that seems as though it should be very simple to deal with. It has to do with the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. And in most cases, that should be simple enough. The Ten Commandments are relatively clear as a starting point, so that in most instances, the good thing to do, the right thing to do, is quite evident. But as well as we may know what is the right thing to do, it is often much harder to actually do it. We may blame our failure quite correctly on the fact that situations are not always as simple as they seem. The right thing to do, if one can determine it, is not always the easiest thing to do or the most comfortable. In fact, it may be quite painful. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself is an example of that, doing what was right, what needed to be done, and that cost him his life at last. Pontius Pilate may serve as another example of the high price that righteousness demands, a price he was not quite willing to pay. From Scripture, we know that while our Lord's trial was going on, Pilate received word from his wife, asking him to, quote, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. That's all we know about this incident. We do not know, for example, whether Pilate and his wife pursued the subject when he returned to his quarters later that day. But we can imagine what we might have overheard. Oh, you're home. Mm hmm Did you receive my message today? Yes, it was delivered. And? And what? And did you release him as I begged you? I'm sure you already know the answer to that. Yes, I do. I begged you to have nothing to do with that righteous man. I know. I got your message. Women's dreams. It was a terrible dream. It upset me greatly. It upsets me greatly that because of a dream of all things, you would interfere with the doing of justice. Perhaps we had better not speak of justice, my husband. What do you mean by that? You condemned him to death, didn't you? Yes, I did. But why? What had he done to deserve death? He was a righteous man. Of course he was. There was never any question about that. The charges were trumped up. That was obvious. The whole thing was some kind of religious squabble. I never did find out what it was all about. We have a law, their counsel said. And according to our law, you have to die. We have a law too, don't we? And according to our law, he ought not to have died. Yes, and that's exactly what I told them. <clears throat> I find in this man nothing deserving death. But then you let him be crucified. Why? For what crime was he put to death? Well, <clears throat> treason was the official charge. Treason? Where did you ever get an accusation like that? He was a righteous man. They said he claimed to be a king. And was he? He claimed to be. Did he really himself? Yes, in fact, he did. And did he threaten to overthrow all of Rome, or even to run you and your legions out of Judea, Pilate? Not exactly, no. He said something to the effect that his kingdom was not of this world, and that his followers had no intention of fighting for it, whatever it is. Then what was the terrible treason against Rome? Woman, you know how these Jews are about their religious beliefs? Was he truly guilty of treason? That is what the inscription of accusation said over his head on the cross. It said treason. This man is guilty of treason. Not exactly. It said, this is the king of the Jews. What is that? Some kind of a joke? No, not at all. In fact, the chief priests and the leaders tried to get me to change the sign. They wanted it to say he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but I wouldn't budge. <laughs> you wouldn't budge. What I have written stays written. I said no. You wouldn't budge. You let them maneuver you, the Roman governor, into condemning an innocent man to death. A righteous man, a man you yourself said was innocent. And then, when the injustice was complete, 
you suddenly got firm in your resolve and wouldn't change the words on a stupid signboard. What I have written stays written. And was he then the king of the Jews, as you wrote? Yes. Do you really believe that, Pontius? Yes, what have I written stays written. For, sorry. For if it were not true, then his blood would be on your hands, wouldn't it? No. As a matter of fact, that is not a problem at all, for I wash my hands of the whole matter. You what? Wash my hands. When they kept shut in for his crucifixion, even after I had tendered my uh, considered judgment, I called for bowls of water and I washed my hands. I am innocent of the blood of this just man, I told them. Yes, I washed my hands of the whole matter. Oh, did you really, Pilate? You rendered a judgment that an innocent man deserves to die, and that is not washing your hands of the matter. Yes, it is. They said, his blood be on us and our children. Who said that? The crowds, all of them. His blood be on us and our children. And is it? Is it what? Is it the truth in his blood now on them and on their children, just because you said so? Yes. Guilt is absolved because I say so. That is exactly how it happens in my court. If I judge a man guilty, he is so. And if I judge a man innocent, then he is without guilt. Is he really without guilt? Of course he is. Or is he simply relieved for the moment of his punishment? What are you saying? I am not sure that you can get rid of guilt just by saying so. I don't know why you insist on trying to hang this petty thing on me. Because you are a judge, Pontius, and justice is expected of well, you. Well, he was the defendant. And he did not defend himself. When I questioned him at length, he remained silent. And did that make him guilty after you had declared him innocent? I tried to set him free. You didn't try. I did try. When I found out he was a Galilean, I even sent him to Herod for judgment. Do you call that justice? Sending him to that petty pretender? I never thought I'd see the day. I never thought I'd see it either. But I will have to admit that Herod did conduct a fair and impartial hearing. And although it put the problem back in my hands, he actually deferred to my jurisdiction. Most polite and proper throughout, even cordial. Perhaps we have managed to uh, misjudge the man, my dear. He is not the only one you have misjudged this day, my dear. You needn't be so sarcastic. But he was innocent, Pilate. Even Herod agreed. Innocent or guilty, he could have ruined everything for me. Oh, is that what you conduct in your court, Pontius, to benefit you? To benefit Rome. Rome could have weathered this little storm, I suspect. It has dealt with worse. And the way it does so is through people like me. It is my job to keep the peace in Judea. And do you keep the peace by sacrificing the righteous? There was no easy decision that could be rendered in this matter. Don't you understand that? No, I don't. There are times in life where there are no good decisions possible, only choices among hard ones. And this was one of those times. What would have been so bad about releasing him? Don't you see, woman? There was no way out of this thing. If I had released him, there might well have been another riot. You know how volatile these fanatics are. They had threatened to inform Caesar. And is that worth the life of a righteous man? Of course it is. After all the things that have been happening in Judea, another incident could cost me my post, my career. Tiberius is not too fond of me to begin with. At the very worst, given the climate of the times, my life could have been at stake. Aren't you being overly dramatic about the whole thing? And aren't you being overly dramatic about the whole thing? He was just one person, one little insignificant person one righteous person. It was his life or mine. Come in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to disturb you, Excellency. Yeah, you certainly did. Yes, what is it? You may recall, sir, that just as Joseph of Arimathea had requested the body of the criminal Jesus once the crucifixion was complete. Yes, I told him I would let him know. Why are you disturbing me now? Well, he has now been joined in his request by a man named Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin. Yes, I know who he is. 
I thought they had all uh, voted that this Jesus was an outcast. They're waiting for your decision, sir. Both. Hmm. Frankly, I'm surprised that a man like Nicodemus would want to identify with this Jesus, especially now that the king of the Jews is hanging on a cross. I never would have expected it from him. Do you have a reply, sir? Uh, yes, tell them I'll be there presently. Yes, sir. Nicodemus, who would have thought Taking a stand like that at a time like this could be political suicide. You would think he would have been more prudent. I'll never understand what makes people do things like that. Yes, I'm sure you never will. What do you mean by all that? Perhaps, my dear, this member of the Jewish council is concerned about something that seems to have eluded your courtroom in this case. The thing that has been bothering me all day. What are you talking about, woman? Another one of your dreams? No, pilot, unless the truth is only a dream. What is truth? It is probably not fair to make Pilate answer that question twice in one day. Perhaps we have put him through too much of a grilling already, although perhaps he deserves it. Among other things, according to the Bible, Truth is something you can rely on, something that remains firm and immovable, solid and unchanging, in contrast to things that cannot be trusted because they shift and slip and slide. Pontius Pilate knew the truth, in this case that Jesus was innocent, but Pilate did not do what that truth required because it might not have been comfortable, even painful. Nicodemus, on the other hand, no, let's not stop with Nicodemus as our example, but go all the way to Jesus himself. Jesus knew the truth. He knew the truth of our sinfulness, our helplessness to redeem ourselves, the truth that the good I would, I do not do, and the evil that I would not, that I do. And he knew it was also true that he had come to redeem the world from its sin and that doing so would require that he forfeit his own comfort. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, he said, and to give his life as a ransom for many. One would like to say, so that makes it easier for us to stand up and do what is right and to act on that knowledge. One would like to say that, but that may not be true. The truth is that following Jesus is still quite difficult, often painful. What he suffered for us may not make it any easier, but it does give us a reason. The forgiveness which this righteous one offers us, the washing that covers more than just our hands, is not just an idle dream to contemplate, but something that changes attitudes and actions, no matter what the consequences. And that is the truth. We will continue with the verse on the bottom of the second page of your worship folders. Would you please stand as we continue with prayer? On what can we rely, Lord, except your mercy and your grace? We cannot trust ourselves, our own powers or wills, or the wishes of our heart, for we are sinful and powerless without your gracious aid. 
Do not enter into judgment with your servants, for in your sight no one shall stand. But send your Holy Spirit on us all, we pray, to convict us of our sin and convince us of your righteousness, righteousness made freely ours through Christ, who went the way of bitter, painful death, that we may stand and walk before you righteous. Show us then the way to walk, the things to do, the word to speak, the example to follow and to be. And when that way is hard, O oh God, make us firm in our resolve and true in our response, faithful in the doing of your loving will, through him who kept that will, and unbent and true for us. In his strong name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.